<laughs> Hello and welcome to Creativity Uncovered. My name is Abby Gatling and I'm on a journey to uncover how everyday people find inspiration, get inventive and open their imagination. Basically, I want to find out how people find creative solutions for home, work, play and everything in between. And my goal for this podcast is that by the end of it, you'll be armed with a whole suite of tried and tested ways to summon creativity the next time that you need it. Now, today I'm speaking to Marty Lee. Marty is a uh, eco living facilitator from Newcastle, New South Wales, and she empowers people to live a more simple and sustainable lifestyle. And you may be wondering, you know, what the link is between sustainability and creativity. And that's really the joy of this podcast because we don't know until we start talking about it. <laughs> and the more we can uncover it in all these different places, the more people will be able to identify with it and um, identify creativity in their own lives. So let's do that in this conversation. Welcome, Marty. Oh, hello, Abby. Now, before we start, I should actually point out that um, Marty has actually gone to the Newcastle Library and hired a podcasting studio so we can have this chat today. What a legend. <laughs> oh, thank you. I feel very special being in the podcast library at Newcastle Libraries. It's a relatively new space um, and it it feels great. Yes. And, you know, how very eco-friendly of you as well to, <laughs> to use one of these public resources. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the library is one of those first places of sustainability. We've always had it there to to borrow things and it's so good that it's come up with the times and we can borrow things like a podcast studio. Yeah, so great. I mean, it means that you don't have to invest in, you know, like a microphone or lighting or anything like that that you may only use once or twice. That's 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 great. Yeah, sure is. Yes. So that's great. Great that you're putting your money where your mouth is. <laughs> Good way to start off this conversation. But um, let's let's go back a tiny little bit. Um, you're an eco-living facilitator. And what is that and what does that include? Uh, as a facilitator, I like to help um, empower our community to live sustainably every day. Um, and so what does that include? Well, luckily, since uh, the easing of COVID restrictions, it includes running workshops uh, for our local community um, and sharing stories the people as well. And so the sharing of the stories can be like, I like to talk to our community and share that either on social media, on my website, or as part of the workshops uh, also. Mm. And what's the ultimate goal there? Like, is it to help, you're helping people become more eco-friendly or like, what, what's the goal? Definitely more eco-friendly, but it helps them to um, understand that living sustainably doesn't have to be all or nothing. All or nothing. They don't mm. have to be that really strong advocate being out there um, as an activist um, that we often see in the media. Um, the goal is to really um, help people understand that living sustainably can be realistic and that we can make changes in our own homes quite easily. Yeah, absolutely. So it's about incrementally making changes to be more sustainable. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the incremental changes are about what we're starting with, what we're really good at and what takes um, our fancy and our what we're strong at doing. So, for example, um, I really love uh, secondhand and pre-loved. And so that's where I started um, with Living Sustainably is how can I incorporate that into my household? And how, how do you do that? Um, well, it all started with op shopping and I think, you know, oh, that was, love it. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> but this was like op shopping um, in the 1980s. So I had a guide camp that I had, I was in the Girl Guide. So I had a guide camp that I had to go on. And one of the recommendations was, you know, have some really old clothes. So I remember going to St. Vinnie's or Vincent to some Vincent de Paul in Sutherland in Sydney in the 80s and buying a pair of jeans for $1 tie-dyeing them Whoa. and having that as my girl guide camping um, experience. So it started then. And then um, 
the op shopping has just sort of grown from there. There was a, a period in my 20s, you know, where I was sort of doing a bit of growing up and realisation and independence where it didn't quite happen. But then once having um, children, I went back into the op shopping. And I would say 100% of my wardrobe um, is now either op shopped, pre-loved, or I've had it for a super duper long time. Wow, that's that's very impressive <laughs> because, I mean, I think firstly, I, I think that um, pro- people probably wouldn't even realise that uh, op shopping is not only, you know, a really cool um, way to get interesting pieces, but it's also sustainable. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, but, but also um, it takes a long time to do op shopping too. <laughs> I, I find like it takes me a good few goes to actually – find stuff that fits and suits and uh so I mean you having a whole wardrobe of it that's really really impressive well I must say I do like it so I dedicate time to do it Um, but also I've had that time since being um having children so I had my first child in 2005 And I noticed that that's when I had the time to go op shopping. I was available at times where the op shops were open. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so from there, I've been able to, you know, purchase things a lot more um, and get more understanding about what I actually like when I go op shopping. Um, And I'm so I'm now really targeted with my op shopping uh, fashion. Um, Mm -hmm. And it also has helped me be creative in what I actually wear. Um, as well, like different styles that I perhaps wouldn't have chosen if I bought these brand new. Oh, it's like a lucky dip. I I love doing that at op shops that I never buy new books. I love to read biographies and autobiographies and I sort of see it as a challenge that every time I go to the op shop, I just find find one there and and I buy it and I read it and then I give it back, you know, a couple of weeks later. But it means that um, I'm reading about all sorts of people that I wouldn't normally read about, you know, Rex Hunt. Yeah, <laughs> Rex Hunt. Wow, Rex Hunt <laughs> and I was like, oh, fishing. But do you know he also played AFL and was a ah. and so <laughs> the things you learn when you op yeah. shop. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of my um, mantras is like you never know what you can find in an op shop. Mm. And it really helps to um, open your mind about what what is out there. And as I said before, things that you wouldn't normally buy um, at the main retail brand new shops, you can purchase at op shops and it gives you a whole different range of experiences and knowledge. Yeah. So do you show people how to do op shopping or is it kind of opening their mind to the idea of the sort of secondhand economy? Um, I have been doing some op shop trails in our local area, um, targeting um, areas where I know there's a string of op shops available. And so I help people, um, you know, say the advantages of op shopping, give a little bit of history about the op shopping as well, uh, and give them some really hot tips. Like if you're after women's wear, don't just look in the women's department, look in the men's department as well, because the op shop volunteers don't always know if that item of clothing is originally uh, intended for a male or female audience. Yes. And also look in the sleepwear that (laughs) that's my tip for people (laughs) is that you can get some really lovely little silk dresses and things like that in the sleepwear. People don't know that it's sleepwear, you know, (laughs) and you can also customize it. So (laughs) that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, on your website as well, you have a bunch of resources showing how people can become sustainable in other ways. Um, And what really struck me about that is that it's about getting into this um, resourceful mindset, it seems. So it's all about using waste in different ways um tell me a little bit tell me a little bit about that because that that seems to be um something that people might need some coaching on Mm. Mm, well let me start with resourcefulness uh because it's only with reflection and time where I've discovered that I've actually been resourceful my whole life uh I think it started when I was younger with my own family um I Uh, I'm a child of the 70s and so I grew up in the 80s and the 80s was very much um, a period of huge commercialization and everything had to be big and extravagant. Um, However, my family um, 
when I grew up in Sydney was not that way inclined. And so everything was really pared back and only spent on what we actually really needed. Mm. Uh, I, I watched play school when I was at that age and the thing that struck me the most that I really, really wanted to do was the useful box and everything that came <laughs> out of that useful box wasn't a toy. It was something that you could find around the home um, and I was always really into that. So in one way, I've always started being resourceful and then um it progressed into my teenage life, the resourcefulness. Mm. Um, when it came to paper, I remember finishing um, high school in the early 90s and I had these reams and reams of paper, of like all my study notes, and I'd written on one side. And so at the end of my school life, instead of chucking it in the recycling bin, I just got it out, flipped it over and then reused it um, ever again. And I think that resourcefulness then continued into the rest of my everyday life and particularly when I had children and knowing that when you first have children, it feels like you can have everything that you ever needed or they or you think that you ever needed. Yeah. But being able to pair back on that um, was most important when I had children. Mm, it- oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And I also forgot to say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, like, because resourcefulness. So like, I'm just sort of talking about resourcefulness <laughs> at the moment. Like, And it's it's a really big part of my life. Um, yeah, I love the enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, um, and I suppose being an early childhood teacher for 20 years as well, that is a key component of being resourceful because we don't get things as an early childhood teacher we don't have enough money to to go forward with things, um, so we need to needed to get as much as we can for free, available, or what was already seen as waste to to be able to reuse that as well. So often the um, when children in preschool were doing paintings, we would be getting the engineers dra- or the draftsman's old. Um, CAD paper or I don't know what you actually, plans, like old plans. So they're nice big pieces of paper that that were used on one side and then the the children would paint on the other side. Um, Or things like going to reverse garbage in Sydney where we would purchase what was seen as commercial industrial waste and then reuse that in different ways. So, So I think all of these elements combined have led to me being resourceful in an everyday kind of way and to see that just because it's deemed as waste doesn't mean we have to chuck it away. Yes, agreed, agreed. It seems like a lot of um, resourcefulness comes from necessity, you know, like you're, you're saying teachers are underfunded, you've got to find a way to deliver your class in a creative way and so it's kind of born out of that. How do you deal with getting people who have the means to be able to buy new or to, you know, live however they want to live? How do you get them to start thinking about being more resourceful when it's not a necessity for them? It really comes down to their want. They want to be able to be resourceful regardless of how much money that they have available to them or resources that they have available to them. Hmm. And it depends on yeah, what their main driving force is for living sustainably because we can't be sustainable if we are purchasing things all the time. Uh, We can use it in many other different ways. I suppose, yeah, it it really just comes down to their own inclinations, how much Mm -hmm. they want to have an impact upon um, the planet and their community without the expenditure and without that realising that, the money means that you need to live, um, you can live frugally even if you've had got money. Yeah, yeah. Seems like there's kind of two challenges there, right? There's the, it's the tapping into why people should be resourceful or sustainable. But then the second part is how easy it is for them to do it in their lifestyle. Like I, I know that whenever I'm talking to anyone about you know, being a bit more sustainable and and people are like, well, I'm just one person. How could I possibly make a difference? You need everyone to do it to make a possible difference. So why do I even try? 
Mm. <laughs> Do you come across that very often? Um, not very often. Um, I suppose the people I mainly talk to are those people who are edging on the side of they want to make a difference, but they really don't know how. Yeah. And so they want those steps to go, well, where do I start? What do I actually do? Mm. And I think it, it is an attitude behavior change thing is you, I'm, I'm not, I'm not there to change people's attitudes because there are going to always be those people who really don't care at all. They're at one end of the spectrum and the other end of the spectrum are those who are highly activists and can't think of anything else. And so I really am there for the people who are either teetering on the edge of don't know what to do, don't know how to do it, I need a little bit of help, to those who are feeling quite confident in um, already making change and they're on to the next change and they're on to the next change. But do that with warmth and mm. an open heart. Mm. So how do you start that process with someone who's like, I'd like to be sustainable, I'd like to live more eco-friendly, but I'm a busy mum with five kids or I work so much I, I don't have time to go browse the secondhand markets or you know how do you how do you start them on that journey that would be a huge conversation of okay so if you're a busy mum and you've got lots of kids and lunch boxes and time is a real um dampener for you at the moment what is it that at the moment you're doing really well at is it perhaps you're wearing the same outfit every day for five days in a row maybe that's the start to living more sustainably in that particular family environment. It really does depend on each person's circumstances mm. and what they want to change the most as well. So it's very mm. easy for us to say, oh, well, you need to walk more or you need to catch public transport more. But if that's not available to you or accessible, then that feels like it's a far-reaching goal. So you need to start much, much smaller than that. Could even mm. be as simple as how you clean your house. How, yeah, how you clean your house. It could be I'm going to start with um, the bathroom and I'm going to change and switch out my cleaning products. So instead of making, um, purchasing the mainstream cleaning pro products, which are highly toxic, it could be I'm starting to DIY, DIY a few cleaning products and I know I'm making a difference to my family and to my ho home as well. Wow. Okay. So, it's, yeah, so it really does kind of go back to that. Thing we're talking about before incremental small changes it's not all or nothing yeah exactly yeah. and you can only do what you feel passionate about and what you feel strong about as well and making those changes and then more importantly making it into a habit mm. that's mm -hmm. that's the whole thing about living sustainably so um, shopping bags um, grocery shopping bags have really been a really big thing in the last 20 30 years um, and there's still people who can't make a habit of taking their own shopping bags to the, the grocery store so that's the habit formation that um, is key as well as people really really have to feel a strong urge to follow through with something in order to do it well yes and I saw that on your website you actually do have sort of instructions on how DIY your own sustainable shopping bag <laughs> out of a oh, t-shirt, yeah. I think it was. <laughs> yeah, isn't that cool? Uh, that really <laughs> combines like the huge textile waste problem we have and particularly t-shirts. I mean, they we, we have lots of t-shirts um, circulating mm. around. And then in order to make that into a, a grocery shopping bag, and it's quite durable, um, it just the, the checkout operators get a little bit um uh, struck by how challenging it can be to fit onto the garbage bag um, holder. But, you know, they work it out. It holds at least four litres of milk. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. And I I mean, uh, with you know, you know, this is about creativity and we sort of talked about it. So much of creativity is a mindset um, and so much of um, sustainability is a mindset. But another parallel I'm seeing here is that it um it's not all or nothing it, if you don't have creativity in your life it's not like you have to go out there and all of a sudden become picasso or whatever it you got to start small find opportunity to build into your life and make it a habit it's like it's just like you said yeah that, that's exactly right it has to and it ha you have to be your own driving force yeah in order for it to work yes yep yep 
And and it helps to have, um, I guess, people around you on that journey, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, whether it be your family, whether it be your friends um, who share perhaps something that you're doing or really admire what you're doing, um, having that extra um, push and it could be just that, wow, I really love what you're doing or, gee, that's great, great thinking. I mean, I had my... Um, I had all my reu- my Snaplock bags. I still do y- use them. There are times and places where Snaplock bags are really, really useful, um, mm. particularly when you go overnight hiking. They're very lightweight um, and they seal up really well. But I don't throw them out. <laughs> I actually reuse them. So I wash them out and I reuse them. And they're hanging up on my clothesline, my inside clothesline. And my mother-in-law comes up and she's like aghast. You're the first person I've ever seen that has snaplock bags on their clothesline and not clothes. But it's just those little <laughs> steps that, uh, yeah, I suppose that is a little bit creative um, and a little bit resourceful combined into one. <laughs> I really find that creativity is at the heart of sustainability it's a really special kind of renewable resource. I, I kind of love that you're merging your experience and your passion <laughs> in this in this business. Like that in itself is creative because quite often people um, keep their hobbies and, and their work life very separate. Yours seems very enmeshed. I think my whole life um, is an enmeshment of creativity and sustainability all up, and it's and it's and just like sustainability, my creativity has been very incremental. Um, mm-hmm. There's been some pivotal moments, I suppose, but um, the more like the older I get, the more I realize that I can be creative. I am creative. I just didn't realize it thirty years ago. You just did, okay. So, what was the realization? point for you? I suppose having the opportunity to let my creativity shine through in many different ways Mm. and also having space and time. So the first time I realized that perhaps I thought a little bit creatively or a bit differently was again when I was on mat leave. Now mat leave was a big thing for me because for my whole life it was either school, uni, uh, full-time work. And mm. then being on mat, li- mat leave was the first time that I was disconnected from work and spent my entire time at home with my new bubs um, and just had bubs myself and the home to concentrate on. Mm. And so then it, it meant that things could start to blossom. You could mm. experiment with things um, and I experimented with home decorating. Oh, yes. mind, yeah, <laughs> so just using I was I, you know, going out for walks with my new bubs and, you know, bringing home some sticks and, oh, what can I do with this? Or there was bulk waste cleanup in our area and people would throw out things that I'd look at and go, oh, I'm sure there's something that you can do with that. Um, And so it would come home with me and then it would sit on the front veranda just waiting for that really ripe time. And then when something did happen, then I would get that external... um, uh, motivation from someone else to say, wow, I would have never thought of that. That's so creative. And and so the more I did things, the more I got this external um, motiva- ma- ma- the motivation from people realising that, oh, okay, I, I'm thinking a little bit differently from other people. <laughs> yeah, la- lateral thinking, it's, it's a huge part of creativity. Yeah. And, and when we spoke the last time, so we spoke a couple of weeks ago, um, that was one of the things that really struck me from our conversation was that um, I think that creativity is about thinking about things a little bit differently. And you have sort of implied that about sustainability as well, that it's about thinking slightly differently from, I guess, what the mainstream is and and the usual path. Like you, like you said, you know, switching out the things that you can easily buy it at your local grocery store <laughs> and and using what you have around the house and maybe going back to those older methods, the tried and tested methods, you know? <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah, and I think it, it creativity is all about thinking differently and it's a real mix of our own imagination, um, having the initiative to try something new, I suppose, having the confidence uh, as well and being really open 
to the possibility that some things might not work and some things will. Um, and then it's just that solving the problems that can happen and being able to think about those problems in a different kind of way. Mm. Uh, yeah, so creativity is, uh, there's huge scope. So, and sustainability, it is all about thinking differently. We can't keep on living sustainably if we just follow the norm all the time. There's always got to be um, like some kind of out of the box kind of thinking to make progression and change happen as well. And I guess over time it will be easier and easier. Like I, I'm definitely seeing a trend you, uh, I'm thinking you probably don't have to think so crazily and out of the box to be sustainable these days uh, because there's more and more options available. There's more and more information available to, you know, at your fingertips as to giving you ideas on how to be sustainable and make these little switches, including lots of t- tons of eco products out there as well. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, it just seems like, it's uh it's it's all about the mindset it just keeps coming back to the mindset to me <laughs> yeah it is the mindset and it's been having an open mind and um being able to see different perspectives on things as well so it is that um the critical thinking is really important about living sustainably because that helps in becoming a um a more mindful consumer and more mindful about what we do but mm-hmm. that lateral thinking about doing it differently um is even more important uh as well and just yeah as I said before seeing things from different perspectives Mm, mm. so what what is creativity to you um creativity to me is it is all about thinking differently it is all about taking that uh different perspective and the perspective that you think is right for you at that time uh and it's also about being curious because creativity is all about curiosity uh, and just be willing to dip in and make some kind of change. Yeah, I love the idea of curiosity because it really is. It's kind of what if and then explore and then find out. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. And it's it's a beautiful word, curious or curiosity curiosity and also wondering you know to have a wonder as well and whether that means wonder in your mind or wonder um for a walk as well as what what else is creativity I suppose um creativity is about the process of doing something and it's really a very slow process uh, but a very rewarding process as well So it's not necessarily, so the difference is, mm, I suppose, play. So when I look back to me being a teacher for all those years, uh, children play all the time. And I think as an Mm. adult, we forget what play means and we forget how to play or our play looks very, very differently um, and is prescribed by rules. Whereas I find that being creative for me is all about that sense of play and having fun and just doing something for the sake of just doing something because it is fun. And then it's from that that we can see, as I said, from a different perspective or see with a new mind or an open and curious mind. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned, um, yeah, children and play and (laughs) how that sort of fades out over time as you become an adult that that has come up a few times and it's I just I wonder what I wonder what it is that happens throughout our journey in life that we are slowly reducing the amount of spontaneous and um you know erratic play (laughs) that as as adults we kind of just walk around you know just on a very set track is what do you think that is that's a big question. Um, <laughs> Don't expect you to have the answer, but, but I just I, I I'm curious about it because it's, it it comes up a lot. Yeah. Like, what, what is happening to us, and what can we do to help the next generation that they don't lose it and oh. have to refine it? Oh wow! I wonder. 
I wonder if we lose that because an adult, we become responsible. And um, as an adult, that everything is goal focused and a goal yeah. is an outcome. A goal is essentially a product. And then we forget that perhaps to get to that goal, there could be different ways of going about that. It doesn't have to be this one streamlined must do kind of effort. Mm. It's that process and that journey that you were talking about before rather than mm. the end result and the mm. destination. Mm. I um I delved into um, oh, the book, Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, mm -hmm. and that was like taking a real liberty moment where I dedicated a day a week just to explore without a map, explore without a goal and just go, oh, I wonder where around this corner, like I took myself for a walk around here in Newcastle one day and just to the whole, instead of walking from A to B, I was walking from A to potentially B, but via, you know, C, D, E, F and G in order mm -hmm. to get to B. And that in itself just helped me sort of clear that mind and didn't have the, you know, because you didn't have that goal. It was all about that process and it sparked a little bit more curiosity and creativity. Mm. <laughs> I was going to ask, like, how do you get yourself into that creative mindset? Is it is it through walking like that and just giving yourself, like you said, the time and the space to just be? The time and the space is so important. But I also find that having a shower is one of my other places of sparking that creativity. Mm. It's not very sustainable, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I might have a five to ten minute shower, but the yeah. offset is I do I don't do that every single day. But the offset is like I live sustainably in so many different other ways, but I have to let my creativity flow somehow. And it's like that yeah. clinching of that idea. So it could be just having a, you know a longer shower than normal. Sitting outside, that's the other thing that I find um, really sparks creativity is going outside, mm -hmm. going for a walk because being outside, it's such a dynamic in environment. Things change all the time, whether it be the weather or the way you, you go to places, um, things change. Whereas when we're inside all the time, it's a very static environment. Nothing changes. The air temperature is the same. The furniture is the same. Very controlled. And absolutely very controlled. But the more like I find that I get outside, the more I allow time and space to be creative and the more I allow my time to be observant about the things around me mm. helps helps delve into that creative side. I think um, <laughs> I was talking about this with, with my husband a couple of months ago that, you know, we're so busy. Both of us run our own businesses. And so we're always in a rush from one place to the other. But whenever you're taking the dog for a walk or, you know, our nieces and nephews, you take them out for a little walk, the pace has to be slower. The dog is sniffing every single tree, is looking at stuff, he's getting scared by the wind and and because you're having to go at the same pace as, as your dog or the kid or whoever, it's forcing you to slow down and it's like kind of also forcing you to observe what's around you as well and you're like, oh, I didn't know that house had painted their door red or did you know there was a park down that corner? Or <laughs> And I kind of love it, this, this forced um, slowness it has sort of, opened your mind to things that you were probably too busy to see. And the time and space that you were mentioning before, I think that's exactly that. It's that you're giving, instead of being so focused on productivity and achievements and all those sort of things, you just give yourself the time and space to be like, to observe and just be like, huh, what happens if I do this? Or <laughs> let me try that out. Aren't dogs and kids amazing at helping you slow down? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. And, and, and you can't be annoyed at it either because they're so lovely and pure <laughs> and so friendly. Yeah, 
Absolutely embracing that. Like when we go traveling, so before having children, uh, when we go traveling, you know, my husband and I would, we'd be on the move all the time. We've got to see as much as we can at whatever times that we need to to be there. But um, having kids and going on a holiday that is like a traveling holiday really does make you slow down, observe things, stop for a cuppa and relax a little bit more. And you probably gain that. Uh, uh, a whole lot more by being so so available to the time and not seeing that time is pressure um, mm, mm-hmm. but just embracing that time so why um do you think that everyone needs creativity in their life oh yes everyone needs creativity in their life my gosh my gosh there's so much more interesting people <laughs> If you've got a little bit of creativity, oh, if you're the person in a crowded room, uh, I can pick out whether you're quite creative or not and you're the type of person that I'd love to spend time with Um, (laughs) because, yeah, creativity makes for interesting people, interesting conversations and makes things happen. So, yeah, I think everyone should embed a little bit of creativity into their life. (laughs) For extra interest. (laughs) Extra interest. And like there's also that inspiration. Like you never know, you, you might become that that person that someone else feels inspired by or they admire something that you actually do. And maybe that admiration is um, something that you've done a little bit differently. Mm. Yeah, I love that. You never know who you're going to inspire. <laughs> you don't. And and whether that's um something that someone openly says that you're an inspiration or it's just like you've added a little um part or a chapter in their story of life. <laughs> that's very sweet. <laughs> I like that. I like that. And so what are some tips that you have? I know we kind of spoken about what helps us get get there towards creativity. Um but what are some tips you think you can share with people if they want to start on that journey and they just don't know what the first step is? Oh, I have a few tips that we might have already touched on. Yeah. But one of them is, yeah, get outside. Mm. As much as you can, get outside. It's a really dynamic environment. Things change all the time. Another tip would be to take an ordinary habit or routine and do it a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. See what happens. Travel, travel more. It doesn't have to be a big travel. It doesn't have to be an overseas travel. But just get out of your home environment because it's very easy for us to very feel very comfortable in our own homes, our own communities. But the more that we travel, the more that it broadens our horizons and our minds. Get out and travel more. Love that. <laughs> Maybe take the time. Like we were talking about time and space before. So take that time to observe and to to listen and enjoy the process of thinking and mm. doing and mm-hmm. giving yourself leeway to make mistakes. That's a big one. That is a big one. Like to not be afraid of mistakes or the fear of failing because that's that stops so many people from even starting their journey. And I know it's a really um, big catchphrase, you know, you can learn from your mistakes, but you really can. But those mistakes can be like little tiny things of accidental, accidentals that then lead to quite big changes in our lives. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, look at so many inventions in life um, that they have been born out of a mistake or uh, (laughs) testing and measuring and something brand new comes out of it. I think I, I was reading the other day about the person who invented sticky notes was actually trying to invent the world's strongest glue and something went wrong in the formula. And so even though it's quite strong, it also can be removed really, really easily and restuck. And so you could look at that and go, that's a failure. Or you go, hey, actually, maybe there's another use for that. <laughs> and so out of that this whole new journey has come out and probably made that guy a squillion dollars. <laughs> and and look how well used post-it notes are now. Yeah, so useful. <laughs> Although uh, sometimes they can be a bit too much, too many around your desk. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Marty. I think um, that was uh, 
That was a really interesting conversation about the parallels between sustainability and creativity. Um, I think there are so many um, crossovers there. Um, so tell me if, if people want to uh, try and start that journey to eco-friendliness, how, how can they get in touch with you? They can get in touch with me via my website, which is frenchfortuesday.com.au, as well as all the social medias, which is um, primarily Instagram and Facebook. Uh, they are the best ways to get in touch with me. Great. And I'll pop all those links on, on our website so people can access them there. But um, thanks so much, Marty, for cho- um, joining me today. And um, I also want to thank um, everyone who has tuned in to listen to Creativity Uncovered. Um, I really hope that this episode has inspired you to take the first step and that it's given you some ideas to help you sow in creativity the next time that you need it. Thanks so much. If you've made it this far, a huge thank you for your support and tuning into today's episode. Creativity Uncovered has been lovingly recorded on the land of the Cubby Cubby people, and we pay our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. This podcast has been produced by my amazing team here at Crisp Communications, and the music you just heard was composed by James Gatling. If you liked this episode, please do share it around and help us on our mission to unlock more creativity in this world. You can also hit subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episode releases.